Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live Signing. I'm Danny Valdez, and with us today is exotic animal veterinarian Evan Anton for the world premiere and live signing of his new book, World Wild Vet Encounters in the Animal Kingdom. Evan takes us to the deep blue seas, swimming with 40-foot whale sharks with puppy dog eyes, to jungles filled with venomous snakes who are more afraid of you than you are of them. And in this book, a race across the savanna and against the clock to save rhinos from the clutches of poachers. All the name of adventure and a deep love for the wild around us. Dr. Anton, welcome. And how are you today? Thank you for having me. And I'm doing terrific. It's an exciting day. I've been waiting for this day for, for years, really, at this point, And it's finally happening. So it's a good day. It's a very yeah, good it's a good day. And now, are, are, we're at, are we at your house? I, I love the pictures behind you. Tell us about the yeah, set. Thank you. We are in my house. These are a few prints for wildlife. Sorry for the reflection there, but um, yes. Yeah, so no, I wish I could say I took these pictures. I've been in, in, in many of the places these pictures were taken and all these happen to be African wildlife. Uh, but this was a, um, a fundraiser by the African Park Parks Network. And they work with a lot of national parks in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I've worked with them a little bit and I yeah. was helping them kind of spread this message. But yeah, they did a great job. They worked with all these professional photographers and I uh, donated and got some cool prints out of it. Wow. I, I almost expect to see like snakes slithering down my screen. Is, is, that, <laughs> is that about to happen? I, I feel like we can, we can grab a snake if you'd like. I've got a tortoise and a snake and I've got my little buddy Henry here, the most wild one. Whoa. Really, he's the furthest thing from a wild animal. He's my Now that's, that's a, uh, a, a miniature lion bear, right? One of the exotic. Yes, a miniature Binturong bear uh, weasel. <laughs> <laughs> or wombat or something <laughs> yeah. and, and at your house you actually have you, you uh tell me about some of your pets that you keep at your house well, we've got henry here my cat was just here and i have we had two cats uh a snake a lizard and a uh, tortoise that just lives in the backyard and she's a very happy tortoise it's a nice sunny day and she eats grass and i'll give her lettuce and some vegetables and she's living the dream out there is this the tortoise I saw on your Instagram that bit your finger when you were feeding yes, it? Yes. Okay. Exactly. Is, is it a? It, it's not a snapping turtle though, right? It's it's a. No. And it, it, and she that wasn't a bite uh, that wasn't like an aggressive bite or you know she wasn't. No, she was eating lettuce. Yeah. Anything. She gets a little bit feisty with her food sometimes. I think she knew that she was getting my finger and she was trying to make a little bit of a statement, but it wasn't like. <laughs> and here's. Here's Willie. Say hi, Willie. Hi, Willie. He's our little our little ginger tiger. Yeah, mini ginger tiger. So fun. Well, uh, for everybody tuning in, thank you so much for being here too. And for the next hour, Dr. Anton is going to be, of course, signing books and answering as many of your questions as possible. Uh, we actually include a certificate of authenticity um, in with these books. And what that means is that these are his actual signature. These aren't uh, print, a printed stamp or a rolled stamp from a press. He is physically signing the books you buy. So that's really special. And for those who've just tuned in and have not yet purchased a book, you actually still have time to order an autographed copy and submit a question to the doctor. Just click over to premiercollectibles.com forward slash Anton to order your copy. So Dr. Anton, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, tell us why you wrote this book and why now? Um, you know, it's funny. I, 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 I did want to write a book at some point. I thought maybe it would be later in my career. Um, you know, I've been a vet for seven years, but when I started writing this book, I'd been a vet for five years. And I started reflecting on my adventures over the last 15 years in, you know, in my, in my, in my efforts to seek wildlife and their, you know, my favorite animals and their natural habitats, all the way to working with animals and realized, you know, I have so many good stories and I've learned so much about wildlife and wildlife conservation over the years and in so many different parts of the world. And so I thought, you know what, I think it's time that we can, uh, that I can share this message, share my passion. And, and, you know, my goal of this book is to, you know, share my passion for animals and, and tell my story, you know, from young wildlife enthusiasts, you know, doing things that I might not do today to, to work with and see wildlife, to becoming a veterinarian that gets to work with, you know, other vets and conservationists from around the world and, and work with, you know, a lot of my favorite wildlife around the world. and and preserving them and and uh, along the book also you know i want to educate people a little bit about animals teach them a little bit about vet veterinary medicine what it's about and uh, most importantly you know teach them about wildlife conservation and, and there's a lot of messages about you know our, our, how to conserve our wildlife throughout the book you know each chapter with each species there's going to be a different message there yeah when when did you 
when did your passion shift from I, I'm going into the veterinarian field of business to I, I want to actually do something for animals? Um, well, I mean, I think being a vet is doing something for animals, of course. But my, you know, it was funny, I was in Australia, I was studying abroad, my first semester abroad in undergrad, I hadn't done a lot of traveling, international traveling by this point, just like we did like a family trip to Mexico. And I I've been to Europe as a very young, uh, at a very young age. Um, and I was in Australia, and a lot of my favorite animals and wildlife are in Australia. And I was, I was growing up, I was very inspired by Steve Irwin. And, uh, you know, I like Jeff Corwin a lot too. And, you know, just seeing these guys get out in, in these natural habitats, looking for this native wildlife and getting people excited about it. And I thought, you know what, that's something that would be really cool to do. I would love to do something like that. And something that's unique about me that sets me apart from other guys like that is that I'm a veterinarian too, so I can help individual animals. But I, I can also, you know, if, if things go well and go as planned, I can, you know, raise awareness and talk about animals on a bigger scale and you yeah. know, help, help a species or a habitat just by, you know, getting people excited about these, these, these animals and, and, and whatnot. Uh, so I, I had my mom send me out my camcorder and a tripod. And at the end of my semester, I had a few weeks between my last day of classes and then finals. They take a big like month gap. And so I set out on a road trip and Sydney's in the Southeast, but I went to the, uh, you know, Western Australia and went all the way uh, all over the Kimberley, which is an area in, in the Northwest covered in waterfalls and national parks and went to the dead center, which has like Ayers Rock and some of those big desert features. And then, and then the top end, which has, um, it's like, it's like the Everglades times 10. It's huge. It's, it's it, it was the wet season. It's just wow. covered with crocodiles and snakes and reptiles. And oh anyway, I was just, I was just, you know, finding wildlife and, and catching some reptiles and talking about them on camera. And it kind of, it started there and then it just evolved okay. and progressed from there. Yeah. And, so, and sorry, I, I said, or doing something for animals. I meant going deeper, going to the next level with animals. Oh, no, I know. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. That's good. Well, a lot of questions have come in from people who have bought your book. And again, for people just tuning in, you can go to premiercollectibles.com forward slash Anton to buy this uh, limited edition autograph book. And I, it sounds like it's a really cool adventure book too. Not only informative, oh, and but it, it, actually, I, mean, I, I, should, I should mention that it's, yeah. it's it's a lot of travel. Each chapter is in a different country. And a big part of the work in getting these places for me was that there was nothing that was going to stop me. If it was physically possible to get there, no matter how gnarly the transportation or the food or the sleeping conditions or what have you, <clears throat> that wouldn't stop me at all from getting to where I wanted to go. So the, yeah. the travel is definitely a fun part of the adventure for sure. <laughs> Man, wow. So are you ready to take some questions from people who yeah, bought your book? Absolutely. Great. So let's go to Niha from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, what is the hardest species to take care of for a vet? Wow. Well, Niha, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think there's it's, there's not one there's not one answer. I mean, for example, you know, I, I have a sulcata tortoise, and to be honest, that species can be very challenging. They're extremely strong. When they tuck into their shell, you can't get them out. Even a tortoise like mine is like this big. If you're looking at her from a bird's eye view, but they can get up to be you know over 100 pounds, over 120 or 30 or 40 pounds. Whoa. Um, and they're super strong. And so a lot of times the only way to work with these guys is, is anesthetizing them and their doses vary from one individual to the next. So you have to kind of start at a modest dose. And yeah. anyway, sometimes it can take hours before you can work with this animal. And then of course I've worked with giraffe and the giraffe is, I think is one of the scariest animals to work with. Wow. And that's not only scary for us as veterinarians and conservationists and, and park rangers and, and everybody that's involved in this kind of a project, but um, you know, it's dangerous for the giraffe too, you know, because we're, we're, we're darting an animal that's up to its head is up to 18 feet off the ground. Wow. And the only way to successfully work with giraffe is actually to overdose them. We intentionally give them too much anesthetic. And then we, as soon as they go down from the anesthesia, we get, we run out of trucks to get to the, to where they are. We like follow them in trucks. We run out and um, the first person there goes and stabilizes the giraffe. So if I was the first person there, I would literally go and, you know, hug this giraffe's neck and stabilize it, get it to the ground and hold it. A, another veterinarian would be right behind me and he would give a reversal medication. So the giraffe wouldn't, you know, be, become fatally affected yeah. by the medications, but uh, it's very intense. I almost got kicked in the head. Uh, wow. One of the first giraffe we worked with, and I actually I had a chapter about this in Uganda about doing giraffe translocation work, and that's that's another story. But um, that was a challenging species and a very dangerous, high adrenaline 
intense animal, uh, you know, species to work with. I actually have goosebumps as you're telling me. I was, <laughs> I, do too. I was, I was, I was away in Africa. Or I forget what you said, but it, as you, what did you? So you, you kind of hug around its neck, and you have to like, sort of help it get to the ground. Yeah, I mean, like, so uh, in many cases, when the giraffe starts to go down, it's very quick. You know, they'll they'll be often they're running. So we're we're darting them. So we're using a CO two like an air powered uh, rifle. Uh -huh. And it shoots out a dart that has anesthetic and it has a, um, a little plug covering the tip of the dart where the hole is. And then once it hits the animal, the plug is removed and then the, the dart is also air pressured. It's back pressured. And so then the, the drugs are pushed in um, anywhere from two or three up to maybe six, seven minutes. The animals start going down. But that happens pretty quickly. So they'll start slowing down from a run and then they might kind of circle around. And we can't really start working with them until they're down, at least on their side. And so wow. as soon as we start seeing it slowing down, we're running and getting as close as we can to it before it gets at least on its side. And then when it's on its side, like we, we I'm right there or, or whoever's the closest is right there. And so when I did wow. this, I would um, literally like the draft would be laying down, like, like, you know, it's like how a dog lays down where they're, where they're laying, their limbs are down, but their head's kind of up. Yeah. When they're like that, their head's as tall as I am almost, or their necks are with their head and everything is in yeah. my head. So I go and I just kind of gently, I don't want to say tackle, but you kind of gently like get your body on the head and gently take it to the ground, protecting it, of course, from slamming on the ground. So I'm trying to stabilize the head, bring the whole neck down and then sit, um, not putting my weight on, but stabilizing the neck because, you know, an animal, you can control most animals by their head or restrain them by their head. If their head is kind of towards the, at the ground, they can't get up very easily, especially giraffe with their super long neck. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much what it would look like. And it's scary because they're kicking and their range of motion with those back legs is substantial. If they really buck around and kick, they, they could reach you and kick you potentially oh. really tight on that neck. So it's, I, um, it's scary, man. And, and it's just the amount of force they can generate with that long limb coming wow. from that here all the way up here where their head is, is, is unbelievable. Well, this is the premiere of your book. So obviously I don't have it yet, but I can't. For, I mean, for that, and I know so many more stories. I can't wait to read this. This is yeah, fun. That was an exciting one for sure. All right. So Kiara from Massachusetts, she writes, you do a large work abroad uh, and working with wildlife, but your primary career appears to be at a companion animal hospital with smaller animals and exotics. Can you speak briefly on comparative medicine and generally what does and does not carry over in terms of practice and uh, physiology? perhaps compare a domestic cat versus a large cat or a similar example. I think sure, this is from sure. a fellow vet. <laughs> oh, right. Well, nice to meet you, Dr. Kiara. And thank you for your awesome question. Um, yes, I do work uh, when I'm working, you know, near, I live near LA and I work at Conejo Valley Vet Hospital and we see a uh, small animal and exotics and we see some wildlife too. Um, so, I mean, some species it's, you know, it's, it's pretty much the same. I work with a lot of monitor lizards, for example. And I've worked with wild monitor lizards in the Philippines or Indonesia. And so if I'm working with a, you know, a, um, a Savannah or Nile monitor in practice or an Asian water monitor, you know, I've worked with Asian water monitors in the wild. So that's of course the same. But then if we're comparing like your example, a house cat um, compared to, let's say I, you know, I worked with a, a jaguar in, uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Um, the, 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 the biggest difference is really the danger when it comes to those animals is the danger that the jaguar poses as opposed to a house cat. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a huge difference when you're working with pets compared to working with wildlife is that most pets, most domesticated pets, as, as you know, Dr. Kara, is that you can, you can you know, work with them in an exam room when they're fully conscious and fully awake. And you know, a lot of your patients might even be excited to see you. Um, you know, some of them are nervous, but it's very rare that they're dangerous. And occasionally, you know, we have to, for our safety in theirs, put on a muzzle or something, but it's pretty rare for you know for us as, as small animal and, and pet practitioners to sedate animals, but when it comes to wildlife, that's almost always necessary, particularly with mammals. There's a lot of birds and reptiles you can work with where I, I don't have to sedate, and I know their range of motion or what the you know what dangers they pose. Um, but yeah, if you're working with a raccoon or a coyote like in California, or if you're working with a jaguar, um, that's the biggest difference. But when it comes to the actual medicine. Uh, you know, I was working with this jaguar and I'm working it up clinically and using my clinical brain as if it's a cat, you know, and this animal was 
had reduced appetite for a few days and um, it was drinking less water. It was a little bit lethargic and I'm thinking all the same stuff I'd be thinking for a cat. And so we, we got him sedated or her sedated. I did a really thorough physical exam, did a thorough oral exam. We got blood work. We got a urinalysis. Um, we got, uh, I think she had a little cyst that we, we got a, you know, aspirated a sample of, but I don't think that was our concern. But anyways, you know, it just depends on the species. But then there's times where I'm working with, uh, say, Binturong, you know, or otherwise known as an Asian bear cat or a Viverid. And um, Viverids like Binturongs and Genets and Fossas and Civets, we don't have any of those in North and South America on the, on the Western Hemisphere. So this kind of medicine, you know, we as vets don't know nearly as much about. So in those cases, it's all about extrapolating and thinking, mm -hmm. okay, what's the closest thing? Okay, these guys are basically carnivores. So I'm going to, you know, approach this as I'm working with another mammalian carnivore family kind of species. But, um, you know, a lot, there, there's just times where we just don't know. And you do use your next closest guess and extrapolate from the animals that you've worked with and the knowledge that we do have and just kind of take it from there. Mm. Uh, Sharon from New York asks, can you open online, an online class to teach people about exotic animals? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I... I mean, to be honest, so I, I graduated vet school and I went straight to practice uh, at Kenei Havali Vet Hospital. I was a mentor. Uh, I'm sorry, I was not a mentor. I had a mentor and I was, I was, and that was my boss at the time and, and still a practicing vet there. And I would bounce, you know, cases off other colleagues as well, but I didn't do an internship. I'm not a board certified specialist in exotic or zoo animal or companion exotic animal medicine. Um, what I do is not, um, is not, uh, you know, at the, you know, I, I'm doing what a lot of other exotic vets do. I'm not doing anything at the top of the field, new, new kind of stuff. I mean, I, I what I'm getting at is I don't know, I'm, I wouldn't consider myself an authority. I mean, I could teach that if it's, you know, for newer vets and people that are just getting into exotics, but really I'm not even the best person to learn from, you know, I mean, I, I do a lot of exotic animal medicine, but for, for learning from that, I would, I would recommend if possible to work with, um, uh, you know, the, the specialists in the field and then and, and, and fully specialized and have done a long road of, of uh, their studies to teach that kind of thing. And, and unfortunately, another thing is, you know, honestly, time-wise, that would be really tough because I do try to get into the practice when I can. And I do have a lot of other projects like writing this book and, and doing, you know, I just got back from Tanzania doing another, uh, another job and getting to, to work out in the field and everything. So scheduling-wise, it would be pretty tough. It'd be fun, though. I love teaching. I love educating people about things, but it's just, it's a, it'd be tough to fit into the schedule right now. I can already see a really rad masterclass though. You know, like <laughs> I'm Dr. Evan Anton. I am the sexiest vet alive. And this is my <laughs> masterclass. Everybody calls you that. And all the interviews I've seen of you, it's just like, we want to welcome to the show, the sexiest vet alive. Now, <laughs> People Magazine started that like what, 2016, 2017? Uh, they started it in 2014. 2014 and then they they they, they called me that again in, in, in 2016 and in 2017 as well but yeah yeah that was that was thanks to people magazine <laughs> so fun um sonia from victoria writes did you ever think that you would become who you are now and that you would have such a power on people to inspire them to help animals i love that question victoria um i can't <sighs> You know, I had a vision when I was in Australia, you know, that's, that's, that's how I pursued a lot of my long-term big goals in my life is, is having a vision. And what I mean by that is, is, is thinking about what, what do I want to be? What do I want to do? And what does that look like? And what are all the steps necessary to get there? And so at that young age, you know, I was 21 at that time when I was in Australia and decided, Hey, I want to do this on a bigger scale. I want to reach a bigger audience. I want to do a lot of what I'm doing today. Uh, you know, really very much what I'm doing today. Um, that was, that was my plan. Um, so I was, I did everything I could to, to get myself here. You know, those videos I was making in Australia, I'd put those on YouTube. Um, and then those eventually got traction. So, uh, you know, amazing opportunities came my way. And so it was like a lot of hard work. And that's where a lot of my success has come from, but the hard work has been a big part of it. And uh, yeah, this was, it wasn't just like random, you know, then I was like, oh, I'm going to have a TV show and oh, look at this, this is cool. And oh, I'm going to be in, um, well, I, it was kind of random to be in people and I'm, I'm thankful for it. It was awesome. But it, I wasn't working towards becoming a, a sexy vet or whatever, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, doing the show and the other projects and the kind of work that I do, that was, that was what I wanted to do. And so that's, that's how I saw it. And I didn't know for sure, you know, but I was, I was going to do everything I could in my power to get here. 
uh, starting 15 years ago. So um, I guess in a way to answer your question, yes. I mean, that was, that was, there was a lot of intention behind, behind all that. Yeah. Uh, Kelsey from Carlisle, Pennsylvania. What is your favorite species of animal that you have treated during your career? Oh, man. Awesome question. You know, I get asked that all the time, and it's so hard to, uh, to put my finger on that. I mean, when I was a kid, I, as a young kid, I, I loved dinosaurs. And I, I would say reptiles really got my love for animals started. Mm. And so I was obsessed with crocodiles and, and snakes, and I love venomous snakes. And um, so, like, for me, wor- as a veterinarian, working with crocodiles, actually being their vet and getting to hands-on work with them and be their doctor is extremely rewarding and exciting for me. Uh, but you know, the more species I've worked with, the more species I fall in love with. I mean, I, you know, I've been working with rhino for the last three years and working with rhino as a veterinarian is one of my absolute favorite species to work with. I mean, they're such big special animals and I've learned so much about them. And from the veterinary perspective, they're very unique, uh, from a medical perspective, you know, their, their, um, their GI tract is pretty much equivalent to horses. Their, their, the, the reproductive tract, especially females is pretty much like a pig's. Um, you know, their, their, their anatomy and physiology and even their muscles and tendons and things like that are, 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 are like no other on the planet. Wow. Uh, they, they're kind of like dinosaurs are like 50 million years old, evolutionarily speaking, the rhino. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I could go all day about my you know, favorite different animals to work with, but th- those are a couple that are, are very special. I mean, elephants, binturongs, you know, the big cats, like I love all that stuff. That's all extremely exciting to get my, you know, for me to get my hands on and, and, and of course be able to work with. As the, what's the temperament of the rhino? Are, are, are they, I don't know, like what would you compare it to temperament wise with an animal we'd be familiar to? Um, okay, so the rhino, it depends on the species. Black rhino can be extremely aggressive uh, towards, um, towards people that work with them. So they, they can be a bit more dangerous, but the wild ones. You know, mm-hmm. I've worked with captive black rhino and a young black rhino and they're just, Young rhino are like little puppy dogs. Oh, you know? wow. I mean, they, they like to play. Yeah. Um, the last black rhino I worked with this little guy named Mickey at the Rhino Pride Orphanage in uh, in uh, South Africa. I mean, this guy was he was he was playing, but he was kind of bullying me around in a playful way, and he was kind of like bucking me with his horn and pushing sure. on me and just you know being adorable. And I mean, rhino love belly rubs, just like you know. If I don't know if any of you guys have worked with pigs or have pigs, but pigs have this little sweet soft spot on their belly, like their lower abdomen kind of oh. by where, where it meets their leg. And yeah. if you scratch them there, they just kind of like go into a trance back to like roll over and they just love it. And rhino do the same thing. So wow. um, I've worked with some rhino in, you know, then our, then our like orphaned rescued rhino that have been in captivity for a little bit and they're totally approachable and, and uh, totally sweet and docile. And with the wild rhino, I mean, with a white rhino, a wild white rhino, they're not as aggressive as the black rhino. Um, but they're still very dangerous. Uh, so, you know, when you work with them, they're not trying to kill you or anything, uh, but you, you, you have to keep a respectful distance. So, you know, it kind of just, it kind of depends a bit on the individual, but uh, yeah, in, in captive settings, you know, they can be, they can be total, total sweethearts. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Daniela from Israel. Do you think it's okay to have zoos? Oh, absolutely. I mean, zoos, Okay, zoo is a very broad word. Okay, there's a lot of different facilities that can call themselves zoos. So is every zoo a good zoo and a good thing for animals and for wildlife? No, there are many that are not at all. Is a good zoo? Uh, For example, you know, I consider a good zoo in the US a good zoo if it has an AZA accreditation. Okay, that's the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And that has strict guidelines for the, the husbandry and the care of these animals. And these zoos are the ones that give back to conservation. So, for example, when I was in Uganda, just talking about that giraffe story, right? We were talking about that. Uh, there were a there was a, a vet from that zoo and a couple board members from the zoo uh, working with us on that trip. And this zoo was out there, um, or the representatives from the zoo was out in Uganda doing this work because they were collecting samples. They were collecting tissue samples and ectoparasite samples and blood samples of these wild giraffe to better understand the giraffe and comparing them with the giraffe they have in captivity to better understand how we can help wild giraffe and, and vice versa. And so um, not only that, zoos, you know, they do all, all good zoos, the big zoos, the AZA zoos, they do major things for wildlife conservation. They, they fund a lot of research. They fund the protection of habitats. They're heavily involved with wildlife conservation in a very major, very significant way. 
Uh, zoos are also a place where, you know, not everybody's as lucky as me. I, I'm, I'm, I know how lucky and blessed I am. I count my lucky stars every day that I get to go see these wild animals in their native habitats around the world. Not everybody gets to do that. And so if we can connect, you know, the public with these animals and they can make eye contact with a gorilla or a big cat or, you know, a unique bird species or whatever it is, something they find interesting, then I think that's a really special thing, especially for kids. And a lot of zoos do educational programs for kids. Uh, so yeah, when it comes to zoos and being important for wildlife conservation, it's not an opinion, it's a fact, and they are important for conservation. When we're talking about zoos that uh, have no focus on species that are of conservation concern, when they have, you know, there's like, you know, cub petting, like lion and tiger cub petting or something like that. Um, if they have, you know, poor conditions, if they do nothing for wildlife and then they're just, you know, you know, animals buying chain link fences and small spaces mm -hmm. and they're trying to make some money, you know, they're in the wrong business. I don't think that's a good zoo. So, um, you know, I almost wish there was a way to categor categorically distinct zoo and make it, there, there's two, there's really different kinds of zoos. Good zoos, yes, we need them. We want them. Wildlife, you know, really, really needs them. Bad zoos, no. And one more thing, I mean, the wildlife that are in good zoos, um, not every species is going to do uh, great in a zoo. And some species do okay. And the way I look at it is that the animals that were like, man, you know, I wish polar bears were kind of not in zoos because they seem kind of sad and it's, it's, it's a little bit depressing because they're always pacing and whatnot. Um, that's controversial and that's a little bit tough, but it, it, at the very least, we can look at these animals as, be, as being ambassadors of their species. Okay, this mm, individual wow. animal at the zoo, he's taking one for the team. He or she is taking one for the team and they're the ambassador, the representative of their entire species. And so when kids and people see this and they're like, wow, you know, this is such a special animal. I really get to see it up close. They might have an interest in conserving it in the future or the zoo might work towards polar bear conservation. And so it's, it's um, you know, these ambassadors, they're, they're, like I said, they're taking one for the team. And so that's, that's another thing we do have to consider. But in the big picture, the species as a whole, that I think is the most important thing. And that's one place where, where animal, individual animal welfare and conservation, wildlife conservation, don't always jive. There's some, some instances where big picture isn't always super ideal for, for maybe an individual or so. So that's, again, it's controversial, but um, yeah, long-winded answer, yes, good zoos are good. Yeah. I love that. Uh, Paolo from Puerto Rico. I love that you're, you have fans all over the world. What was That's your most cool. shocking surgery? Oh, man. Um, you know, this, this is one I, I, I like to talk about. I had a, uh, a, a yellow anaconda, female, and it was a rescue. And she was an adult at that time. And we didn't know anything about her history or where she came from or whatever. And uh, she wasn't doing super well. She wasn't eating a whole lot and she wasn't underweight. But anyways, we, 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 you know, we started working her up and on x-ray, we saw that she was pregnant. And so we're like, oh, okay, so we're just gonna have some babies. Um, you know, we gave her some nutritional support and some supportive care and just did what we could to just make sure that we, she's as, as healthy as we, we think we could get her to be at that time. She ended up having one of the babies, one of the 21 babies that were inside of her. And anacondas give live, they have live birth, by the way. They don't lay eggs yeah. like the old world pythons. New world pythons and boas give live birth, like red tail boas give live birth, but reticulated pythons, Burmese pythons have eggs. Um, anyhow, so uh, she had a baby and then it was a, few, a couple days before anything else came out. So we tried medical management, giving her actually similar you know, medications you give humans like calcium and oxytocin and trying to just get that uterus to contract and push those babies out, nothing's happening. So we had to go to surgery uh, with a snake. Every organ in a snake is like a long skinny version of what other vertebrates have. Their liver is long and skinny. Yeah, Their lungs yeah. are long and skinny. They really kind of just have one lung. Um, but anyways, everything's just elongated and skinny to fit, obviously, their long and relatively skinny body comparatively compared to other vertebrates, right? Uh, same goes for that uterus when it's full of babies. And in wow. this seven foot snake, uh, five feet of her had babies in it, had oh. uterus. And so we, I needed to do, um, you know, basically a, a C-section. You know, I needed to get these babies out, but I was not going to make a five foot incision in this snake. Right. Right. And so what I did was, is I did basically four different little C-sections. And so I would, at each foot uh, of, of where babies were each, you know, 15 inches or so, I would open up about six inches and pull out all the babies I could in that area, 
close it up and then move on and then do the next six inches and pull out the babies and close up and then move on. And so it was like a little assembly line of C-sections all on the same animal. <laughs> but um, yeah, she did great. Uh, unfortunately, the babies, uh, none of them survived. And I, I, I don't think it's necessarily our timing. I think, uh, I think she had some nutritional issues and some other problems going on to where I, I was surprised she even had one live baby that did end up doing fine. But um, yeah, the babies unfortunately didn't make it, but uh, mom did, she did great. And she, she, she trucked through surgery and recovery. And, and that was one of the, that was, that's the only C-section I've done on a big, on a big, uh, a big uh, anaconda like that. <laughs> it was pretty oh great. my gosh. You, it makes me want to go study and learn and come out there with <laughs> you, man. That is fascinating. Um, cool. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's cool. I like to hear that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, well, and it reminds me of like when I go, our, our, you know, shout out to our local Nashville zoo, who is an example of the good zoo yeah. that you're talking about. Every time I take my family and we're members, um, I, I leave there wanting to like take care of those animals or just be a part of that somehow. It seems like so much more of a pure profession than so much available, you know? Yeah, no, so, Danny, I, mean, I think that's a perfect example of what we're talking about. I mean, just yeah. hearing you say that and that you and your family appreciate that how else are you going to see those animals easily? I know. You know, I mean, that's yeah. and if they're doing good things and helping wildlife conservation and educating people about the zoo and the, and the, yeah. and these animals, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's very good. Wow. Uh, Natalie writes in from Florida, although vet medicine has come so far, what's the one medical advancement you wish to see in the next five years for animals? Oh, wow. That's a phenomenal question. Um, oh man. Um, you know, I think with animals, there's so many different things we can do. There's so many different avenues to kind of to kind of take that question down. I mean, I, I like to think of when it comes to, you know, um, wildlife management uh, and even things like pest control. Like to me, it's so weird to turn on the TV and see a company advertising that they'll kill your rats and stuff like that. Like I just I still can't wrap my head around it. And that's the time we're in. And it just seems so it just doesn't seem like it should be that way still. And it seems like there's other things we can do to help control the wildlife that we live amongst in, in their homes. And people look at it as like, oh, this wildlife, it's in my yard, it's in my home, they're invading my space. No, like, come on, you guys, like this, we, we invaded their space. Like, We've definitely invaded their space. Yeah, there's no I'm question. Sure. You know, so I, <laughs> yeah. this isn't, I guess, necessarily uh, animal medicine, but I wish there was more effort and more empathy put towards doing these kinds of things and, and discouraging, you know, animals to be in your personal private yard, if that's what you so desire in a more humane way. You know, I just, I hate the traps and the, and the poisons and the, all that stuff. And it's, it's, um, it's tragic, you know, and it's, that's something I think that can involve research and things to kind of change, but um, you know, I mean, you could take that so many, I mean, that, that can get, that's a road you can go down in so many different ways in, 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 in the conservation aspect too. You know, I mean, I wish, I wish more people kept their cats indoors. That's not vet medicine, but it's like, we can't do this anymore. You know, cats kill billions of wildlife animals every year, billions. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, millions and millions around the world, you know, probably, you know, estimated it's like an estimated what a million or 2 million animals every single day in Australia, you know, wow. not just one country, one, you know, big country, but, um, but yeah, I wish there were just, I wish we were just a little bit, you know, more empathetic towards wildlife in a, in a, in a, in a big way. Uh, even the animals that we consider pests. And I don't like to call any animal a pest, you know, and I wish, you know, every animal has its place. Nothing's a pest, but we just need to figure out a way to live and work with them better. And I think through pheromone research, you know, sense of smell, which is such a huge part of animals and something that we don't think is a big part of our lives, but I think is in our subconscious brain more than we, we realize. But if we can explore that or or sound deterring or things like that. I just wish we could utilize more this day and age, you know, it's 2020. And um, I, I think we as humans are, you know, we should be doing better. I absolutely love your heart and perspective. Uh, my family, I have four kids. My wife and family thought I was a little crazy because every spring we would have a, an army line of ants marching around our cabinets. <laughs> and the, just the default from, you know, the way you were raised is like figure out how to kill those ants or get rid of those ants. Yeah, of and I would never let our family do it. And then I, and I couldn't figure out why I was just like, I can't imagine just mowing down these ants. And then I said, for all we know, they are working hard to carry off some sort of invisible bacteria that we can't even see. 
And when we're done with our meal, they come out and they clean, they're the cleanup crew. We don't know. And so I, that, that's actually a cool perspective you have of how can we maybe even, and I've said this to my family, like, could we train these pests? You know, even, even the mice, like maybe there's a purpose, maybe we can reroute them. So I, that's a side note, I know. Um, but well, you know, it's but, funny you say that. I was just yeah. in Tanzania, like I said, yeah. and you were talking about the, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the species of ants. It was Safu ant, or oh, I can't remember the exact name. Anyways, this is very deadly, dangerous ant species. Um, they travel by the thousands and th- probably by the millions, honestly. Um, and they can they can eat and consume through anything. I mean, to the point where they've like killed people. Like they're just their their sting is 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 pretty harsh. And when you get stung enough times, it can be a big problem. And they've killed animals and things, and they just mow over them and they just consume and consume. And anyways, um, the one of the guides I was with was telling me how uh, they'll get into people's homes and they'll be in their kitchen, and it's like you just have to leave your house. There's no controlling wow. them. It's way too dangerous and intense to stay in there, and you just leave. But the 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 cool thing is is if you've had any like clogs or, or messes or any like yeah, they just clean up everything. It's like this cleaning crew, just okay. like through your yeah. kitchen. And then it's like, okay, cool. You just, you let them do their thing. You accept them. This is part of the nature and part of what it means to live in this part of, of Tanzania. Um, yeah. and I'm sure other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and the equatorial Africa, um, accept it. And, and then, you know, you know, look at the, look at the, the positive light and that they've kind of just like done this thing. That's actually really great for your kitchen at the end of it. So, yeah. I so that's confirmation. That. I'm reporting back to my family with this and, and, uh, you know, I, I think not only your heart for conservation, but the fact that you've put that into a book and it sounds like you're not only taking us on adventures, but there's this conservation preservation aspect of this. And so, well, and I, I don't know if you've said this yet or not, but I'm proud to say, having just heard from you that I do feel like buying this book is a way that we can support that. If, you know, a lot of books go to only supporting um, an author's perhaps income, but your income is based around the preservation and conservation of animals. So um, I really hope people do go to premiercollectibles.com uh, forward slash Anton for this and get a copy. It's signed. It's awesome. And it helps conservation and preservation. So let's go. Let's keep moving to. There's a lot of conservation messages in there. And yeah, uh, yeah, I spend a lot of my, I mean, when I, you know, I spend a lot of my own time and money when I'm doing these conservation trips. So um, mm. and keeping my message alive and, and just keeping, you know, just educating people about, you know, modern day conservation issues is, um, that's, that's a way that, 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 that can help me do that. No question about it. And then, you know, answer your last question. Another thing, just like with the pests, same thing with like food animal production kind of stuff. I don't think that's going to go any way anytime soon. I don't think it's going to change, but, yeah. um, you know, I think even in developed countries like this, there are ways we can be you know, and these companies know it. there's more humane ways to do it. We just need to figure out a way to motivate people to understand that and then pay more because it will cost more. You know, people, we can get such cheap meat, but buying cheap meat means you're voting for meat to be and animals to be cared for a certain way. So that, that's a whole other message. But I wish mm. I wish to this day and age that was a little bit different. Yeah. Um, which brings us to a, a great question to, to in this vein from David in New York. What is one thing from your perspective that we could all easily give up to help uh, to better help endangered animals yeah um uh yeah there's there's you know i mean single serving plastics i mean that's that's a you know if we can just try to use less of those that's a great way to just protect our environment and then just try to it's listen plastics a great material i don't hate on plastic i love plastic i'm thankful that we as humans have figured out this material because it is amazing and has its applications, but it's a soup. It's a huge bummer that plastic is used in all these single serving fashions and it's meant to be used once and then discarded. That's that plastic should never be used like that. It has such a long life and it's so durable and that's what the beauty of it. But when it's used in this way where it's not, you know, you, we're not using it for its, its whole life and we're just discarding it and turning it into trash as soon as we drink through it or eat with it or open up a package that it was wrapped, you know, was wrapping it or whatever. It's just a, it's just a bummer. And another thing that's a big part, and I guess I, I would, I don't know if it's, you can call it giving up, but um, 
you know, just being intelligent on social media, I think is one of the most effective ways to help, excuse me, sorry guys, uh, is such an effective and important way to help with the conservation of our wildlife. And, and what I mean by that is, um, I've kind of got a soapbox, so I'll try to kind of keep it brief. But I, I'm very concerned that social media's net effect for wildlife conservation is a is is one that is negative. Wow. Um, there's there's so many good people doing good things, and I, I try to do good things, you know, from my brand and my page and, and the work that I do, obviously for wildlife conservation. But man, there's so many people that are ignorant. They don't even they don't have a bad heart for animals. I'm not saying they don't like animals but just what they're doing is actually destructive towards wildlife. And so one of the classic ones is when it comes to primates on uh, social media, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or whatever. Um, when you see chimps, for example, dressed up uh, in, in clothes or, or they're playing with other pets, like a dog or a cat, like domesticated pets, or they're taking a bath or playing on their phone or doing anything that makes them resemble a pet. A lot of people don't know this, but this fuels the poaching of wildlife. Okay, this this wow. this makes baby chimps that much more desirable to be captured from the wild. And to capture a baby chimp from the wild, its entire family has to be killed, an average of 10 chimps, but often 20 or 30 or more. Um, and then these chimps are abducted from, you know, equatorial Africa, and then they're taken to Syria and other parts of the Middle East, and then they're also taken to parts of China and Southeast Asia to be uh, either pets, often pets in the Middle East, and then pets and, and even more often to be like roadside zoo, you know, trick animals. Uh, to do tricks for tourists and things like that in 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 the uh, in Asia, and on the way, you know, to get a chimp from Africa to those places, eight or nine out of those chimps die. So every chimp that you wow. see that's caught from the wild, there an average of a hundred die, but it's often more. And anyways, what I'm getting at is when you engage with that content where it's a chimp that looks cute uh, and looks like a pet in any way, and you say, "Oh my God, that's so cute," or "Oh my God, I want one," or you're sharing it, or commenting it, or liking it, or doing anything like that. You are essentially voting for this kind of content. You're making, you're going to help it get more engagement and get more outreach. And it's fueling the, the 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 poaching of these animals. It's fueling primates as pets, and they should not be pets. The same thing goes for big cats. When you see, you know, a, you know, the jaguar cub or a lion or a tiger cub in a hotel room being pet and played with, it's fueling the breeding of them in captivity. It's fueling them being captured from the wild. It's fueling, you know cub petting and roadside zoos and, and bad things and aren't doing anything for the individual animals involved and doing nothing either for the, the conservation of these animals as a whole. And so to, to make this answer short, I'm just saying be, a, be responsible on social media. And I hate saying that because we go in there to be entertained. We're not going on there to necessarily to be responsible people. I like to have fun and you know look at funny stuff and enjoy social media too. But if you can... Um, if you can just think it twice before you engage with certain things, that can make a real difference. And that's not asking for any money or asking for you know you to put any significant amount of time in anything. It's a very simple way to just help our wildlife. Man, I never thought about that, but that is such a good point. Um, Katie from Alberta, what is your favorite animal? I know it's cliche, but do you have one that inspires you the most as a vet? Um, <clears throat> You know, growing up classically, my favorite animal was crocodiles. Uh, they're, you know, evolutionarily speaking, they're total dinosaurs. Some of our croc species have been around unchanged evolutionarily speaking for, you know, upwards of 200 million years, maybe more. Mm. Um, I find them absolutely beautiful. Uh, I just think they're so neat looking. I love their adaptations. I love that they are so durable and that they can survive mass extinctions and they have survived mass extinctions i just it blows my mind um and so yeah i mean that was that that's you know, anytime i get to work with those guys it's it's a total trip it's a dangerous animal to work with and it's a handful and it's you know it's it's exciting and and croc medicine's really interesting and unique and different compared to other reptiles and um yeah, I mean, that's one but really I mean all anytime i get to work with this iconic wildlife like i get that same kind of uh, you know, motivation and inspiration working with these animals. When I get to work with the rhino, when I get to work with the binturong or the other endangered species I've worked with, it's like, man, I get to help not only individual animals, which is so rewarding as a veterinarian, and then I, I get to help, you know, with this with this overall conservation of this species. I mean, that's that wakes me up in the morning. That keeps me going. That keeps me very excited and very passionate about what I do. And I'm I'm, I'm really lucky to say that. But but that's you know. A lot of those animals kind of provide that for me. So, so I don't really have like one specific species, but I love, I love it. I love what I do and all those animals do it for me. 
Mm. Peter from California, what is the one animal you have not worked with yet or seen in its natural environment that is the, at the top of your bucket list? I mean, I've been saying this for years. I still have not worked with as a veterinarian, a king cobra. I am dying Whoa. to work with a big king cobra, like a big one. That That's the opposite of what I've always said about king cobras. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, yeah, they're way up there for sure. Um, you know, I've, I got to help out and do a little bit of work as a vet student with tigers, but I would love to work with tigers in their native habitats. And I've, that's not something I've, I've had the opportunity to do either. And that's the, you know, the ultimate or the, the biggest of the big cats. Right. So that'd be super cool. I'd love to work with grizzly bears uh, and just, and just, you know, just the utter size of those animals blows my mind. Um, yeah. Yeah. Those are a few for sure. King Cobra, man. Woo. Like I've seen them on YouTube and it's just, it, it kind of takes your breath away a little bit, even seeing it on a video. I mean, just for them to just stand up and I mean, they are Kings. They are Pharaoh Kings. <laughs> they are. Well, you know, they call snakes when they're called a King Cobra or a King snake. The reason they're called King is, is generally because they can, their diet is, is primarily snakes. No way. Yeah. So King I did cobra not know that. Pretty much like if, yeah, like when a captive King Cobras, many of them eat snakes, you know, and in the wild, that's really pretty much all they eat. Wow. So I wonder if you will humor us, doctor, with 22 questions in two minutes. These are all fun. They don't have to be right, but we like them to be fast uh -oh. uh, to get to know you a little bit better. What do you say? Right. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. Uh, where were you born? L Lenexa, Kansas, near Overland Park. Who would you want to play you in a movie? Oh, man. People always compare me to Henry Cavill. So Dude, I, guess I was all ready. <laughs> yeah, in face and build. Superman, uh, what was your first job? Uh, my first job, I, I mowed lawns growing up. Awesome nope. job for growing up, like a, uh, having a business. But yeah, that was my first like job. What is your biggest fear? Not snakes. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, people they're just sketchy people sketchy people that have nothing to lose those yeah. are the most dangerous animals if you will in the world in my opinion wow who makes you laugh the most oh gosh um i love silly humor like will ferrell and zach galifianakis and just like ridiculous stuff like that and i just saw the new borat movie like sasha baron cohen he's i've loved him for like 20 years yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, what is the one thing you need to have in your fridge at all times? Um, oh man. Uh, I don't know. Carrots, I guess. This guy, he eats so much, so many darn carrots. <laughs> your baby. dog eats carrots? Oh, yeah. It's good. It's, it helps slow down the, the progression of dental disease. Um, really? And it also helps them, you know, feel more full so you don't have to feed them as much dog food and stuff. But Do, yeah, do all dogs, eat, eat would all dogs eat carrots? Not some dogs are picky and don't like them, but most dogs, um, most dogs will eat carrots for sure. Noted. Trying that this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, what is your greatest accomplishment? Um, yeah, it sounds cliche, but honestly, I'm so proud of just being a veterinarian. That was a tough program and graduating from a, a very good school, Colorado state. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that, I guess, you know, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm super proud of that. Yeah. Um, who is the most interesting person you met recently? Mm, um, well, at the, at the day after my birthday on December 13th, uh, mine's December 12th, I got to meet um, my lifelong idol, Arnold Schwarzenegger. So it wasn't super recent, but I'm a yeah. huge fan of, of his whole thing is about the vision. You know, he's like, I want to be the best bodybuilder. I want to be the biggest action hero. I want to be the governor in California. And he just has a vision, sees what he has to do and makes it happen. So that's super inspiring to me. And Dude, love him for that exact same reason. His motivational speeches are second to none. Yeah. Uh, from, from where he started to what he's accomplished is breathtaking. It really is. Uh, what is your middle name? Sean. What is your biggest pet peeve? Gosh. Um, I... <laughs> I have to admit, I have a, a bit of uh, misophonia. What is this? <laughs> uh, I am, um, I don't know why I'm like, feel funny to say this, but I, I, I mouth sounds like, <laughs> <not doing laughs> okay. Yes. Like, 
I can't like I just if we, you know I have to like turn a TV on or something to drown it out. It just like <laughs> I I don't I can't explain it. It just like it it bugs the it bugs the heck out of me. I just I can't do it. How about someone eating cereal and milk? Yeah, and like oh my gosh, the oh, worst. <laughs> yeah. What is the last book you read? Um, the last book I read. Um, oh, the Sixth Extinction. Mm. Uh, what is your favorite hobby? I have been, I dove in nose headfirst into woodworking. This yeah. Year, since the pandemic. And I'm like okay. loving it, man. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, what is your guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure. Um, I love gummy candy. Like I can oh. binge on black licorice, like nobody's business. Dude. On a movie night, I'll get through a whole bag of that stuff. It's, it's pretty bad. Yeah, I'll I'll uh same but on the sour end. I like all the all right. yeah, and I'll well, that was the I'll, best, right? I love oh, it's, it. It's the best, and I'll hurt myself doing it on movie night too. Yeah. <laughs> Just, uh, do you have any hidden talents? Um, when I was a kid, I could do really really good armpit farts. <laughs> you know, like these ones. I know the ones. And then when I started like yeah. working out and stuff and like changing like the structure of my body, I just, I kind of lost it. Lost the touch. Uh, I guess these, I'm, I'm pretty decent at a few animal sounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you got one you can share with us? Um, Henry, come here. Henry Wood, come here. Um, all right, yeah. Dude, that was incredible. <laughs> I did that to these Asiatic elephants in uh, Nepal, like a whole group of them. And then they, they were screaming back at me. We were, I was like talking to them. It was so freaking cool. That's awesome. Hopefully you were saying the right words. Yeah, I don't know. They were, they were loud. I, I might have offended them. <laughs> Insulted their mother. Um, yeah. What is your secret snack? Secret snack. Um... Carrots. Yeah, right. I mean, I do like my carrots. Uh, I actually, I love these. Um, they're like these off-brand like Cheetos, and they're uh, they're really good. Hmm. How do you take your coffee? Uh, I like to have a little bit of. Uh, I mean, usually I don't put anything in it. To be honest, I have this like Nespresso thing, and I just I don't touch it. I just I mean, but they're kind of flavored, so I don't know if that really counts. But. Yeah. Um, you know, if anything, maybe a little bit of almond milk or something, but. What's the last movie you saw in theaters? Shoot, you don't want to know. I do. Uh, okay. Back I'm to the not, future. <laughs> yeah, right? I'm not like a, I, I love movies, love movies. I'm not a big going to the theater guy. So the last movie I recall seeing in theaters was Batman versus Robin. Like, whoa. Or, I'm sorry, Batman versus uh, Superman. And that was like. I was at 2015 or something. I don't even know. It's at least at least that far for sure. A minute. Um, what causes dear to your heart? What causes dear to my heart? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's pretty cliche, but I mean, just just raising awareness for wildlife conservation. I mean, there's just so much that people don't know and realize, and there's just just simple, easy things to kind of educate people on. Just it's the awareness, you know. We don't. It's like that saying, I mean, Jane Goodall said it, a few people have said it, you know, something like you don't, you don't love what you don't know and you don't want to protect what you don't love. Something along those lines. So my yeah. goal is to just yeah. get to know out there. And if you love it, great. And if you want to go the extra step and protect it, even better. Wow. What's number one on your bucket list? Um, okay, so... <laughs> I am trying to arrange a dive trip to Tiger Beach and that's in the Bahamas. And so it's these big sandbars where tiger sharks come in a few months of the year, kind of towards like right, right around now through like January or so, maybe maybe September through January, February. Uh, but in December, the great hammerheads are there too. And wow. they're, like, these, all, they're like 15 feet, give or take the big ones. And they're just, you can swim right next to them and they come right next, you know, you're, you're touching them and moving them around and like, this really unique kind of like place where you can interact with these monster sharks. And so 
like my immediate focus, like right now is on that, but there's a long list. I mean, I haven't been to Madagascar. I haven't worked with, uh, you know, been to India. Uh, There's, I mean, there's so many more, but right now I'm like super keen to jump in with, with, with uh, the hammerheads, but the tiger sharks is a really fun chapter in the book. A really fun chapter. That was one of my, I mean, that was my favorite dive. I dove all over the world and that was, those are my favorite dives swimming with big mega carnivores in the open water, wild sharks, just oh. like super, super cool. Man, the, the childlike animal lover in me can't wait to get this book. And that's all the time we have with the sexiest veterinarian alive to order Dr. Evan Anton's limited edition autograph book. Go to premiercollectibles.com forward slash Anton and to be a part of the live signing experience with more of your favorite authors, follow Premier Collectibles on Instagram or Facebook. Dr. Anton, from all of your friends who've tuned in and from all of us at Premier Collectibles, thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you so much, Danny. For all you guys that tune in, I really appreciate you. It's it's, honestly, you guys help me in a very big way get to do what I get to do. And I love, you know, giving back and sharing my stories and what these messages of wildlife and and animals and and just getting people excited about them Mm -hmm. is all about. So big, big thanks to all you guys. I really appreciate you. Your words have touched my heart, brother, and I know so many. See you guys.